We will now start the mobility sector presentation session. The presenter is Executive Vice President and Executive Officer, Mr. Alistair Dormer. Uh, thank you, everybody, um, and uh, welcome to the mobility uh, presentation. For those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, Alistair Dormer. Uh, so I'm the Vice President responsible for mobility, which includes the rail sector and the building systems uh, business unit. So for me, uh, this is day number 64 of uh, living in Japan. So thank you very much for the warm welcome uh, that I've had in Japan. And there's also another great benefit of living in Japan, and that is that I don't have to listen about Brexit news every night on the TV. Um, anyway, that's enough about uh, me. Before we go into the presentation, we'd just like to show you a short video uh, just to put a bit of color around the mobility sector to show you some of the products and services that we have operating all around the world. Okay, I hope you liked uh, some of the visions and some of the views uh, of some of our products in service. Let me just, uh, just talk about the key, some of the key messages that I will cover in the presentation today. Uh, in the mobility sector, we've grown 
uh, pretty strongly uh, over the last uh, five years. And we have very, very solid uh, order backlog uh, that will grow over the next midterm plan continuously. We are in a phase of um, investment. So we're investing in our capability, both uh, digitally in terms of how we optimize the products and services for our clients and also how we add additional value uh, to our clients. Um, we will also increase our service mix towards FY 2021. Uh, we have a lot of assets now, many more assets uh, in operation than we had uh, five years ago. So our service revenue will grow um, progressively towards uh, FY 2021. And from a, um, a growth point of view, really we're looking um, at the M&A market in terms of where can we find the right solutions to make that next big step uh, in the mobility segment. So just an introduction, um, this is where we sit, very similar to the, uh, the other presentations uh, as you've seen, but let's go into a little bit more detail. So mobility is around 12% uh, uh, of Hitachi's uh, revenues. Um, you see their consistent growth uh, in the sector. This has predominantly been driven uh, by the railway sector. So the rail sector has enjoyed a 39% compound annual growth rate uh, over the last five years, uh, which is very strong. Partly that was due to the acquisition of the Anseldo uh, companies. But if you look between uh, FY16 and FY2018, we've added 120 billion yen of organic growth uh, in the rail sector. So very, very strong performance. From a profitability point of view, um, this year, I think, is, uh, is very, has been very strong performance in FY18. Uh, FY16 and FY17 were slightly lower because that's when we were integrating the Anseldo SDS and Anseldo Breda businesses, but also turning around uh, Anseldo Breda, which is now performing very well. Um, talking about the macro trends of uh, the mobility sector, we... We're in the middle of continued urbanization, population growth, and climate change. So that is driving demand for clean, efficient mass transit and mobility solutions from our customers. So we see this as, a, as an ongoing trend, um, and therefore mo mobility will see uh, continued demand going forward into the future. Um, from a, a, social economic point, a social development point of view, we are a responsible global company. Um, now, you would expect that uh, we're investing in our designs and in our products and services to reduce CO2 and to reduce um, energy consumption and emissions, but we're also looking at other areas. So, for example, um, we are sponsoring a school in the United Kingdom to try to uh, encourage young kids to study engineering and to become a pipeline for the future engineers of the future. Um, I, just the other week, I was at the training centre for our elevator and escalator division um, to see uh, the technology around an escalator, which as you walk towards the escalator, if you uh, are walking very slowly, the escalator will automatically slow down. So if you're elderly, or if you're like me, uh, you'd hurt your ankle running, and therefore we're walking very badly, um, this is, is great for social inclusion. So this is a real added value, I think. Um, and, and finally, let's just, just make a comment about uh, social media. Particularly in the railway sector, we get a huge amount of traffic in terms of social media about people commenting uh, on our trains and on our services, and it's great to see so many positive comments about our products and services um, out there from passengers that are using our trains. They aren't always positive, but that's the power of social media. You always get uh, a huge mix, but it's a great source of intelligence for us uh, in our business. 
So let's talk a little bit more uh, about uh, Building Systems BU. C can I just introduce uh, CEO uh, Seki-san and CFO uh, Harada-san? Uh, many, many years uh, of experience uh, within the Hitachi Group and uh, leading uh, the Building Systems business, and I'm, I'm really enjoying uh, working with them so far. So, and they will be here to answer all the difficult questions at the end of the presentation, if you have any. Um, just talking about the building systems business unit. So in terms of revenue, uh, we are split between majorities in China um, with good revenue source in Japan and a small, relatively small footprint in, um, in the uh, Asia Pacific region. From uh, line of business, uh, we have around 57% in new installations and 43% in service. But our service business grows as our new installation um, backlog grows uh, in, in the field, so to speak. Um, we're very proud of our achievements. So I put these into two uh, categories, really. One is uh, innovation. So we have the world's fastest elevator. And the second one being, um, we're also working with our customers in terms of how do we enhance, enhance products and services. So we've deployed the EMU uh, robot uh, into Yokohama, uh, which is helping um, our customers help their, their visitors and their uh, tenants with directions around that, uh, that complex, uh, which is an amazing, amazing thing to see. Um, the other area is really an export. So China has been the growest, fastest growing market in the elevator uh, escalator uh, business for a number of years now. So we are number one in China in terms of the, the high and medium end um, escalator market. And we, over the last three years, we've really, um, really opened new sales channels across Southeast Asia by opening a number of channels, a number of partnerships with uh, local organizations so that we can be prepared for further growth in what is going to be a very fast and a very uh, big market for uh, building systems, products and services. Um, lots of deliveries in FY 2018 uh, in China, um, in Japan uh, and in, in Thailand but also a lot of very good quality orders received. Um, again, in our, our traditional markets of, of China, uh, uh, Japan, and Thailand, but also, I think importantly, making more headway uh, in India, which with you know, one billion population and a number of uh, mega cities uh, in the Indian uh, subcontinent, I think this is an important market for us uh, as we look forward to the future. Um, Look at the numbers. So from a revenue point of view, um, we very much outperformed our target. This is because there are a number of projects uh, that were actually accelerated from FY19 into uh, FY18. But profitability um, strong, free cash flow uh, was very strong. Um, so I think um, the team have done a very, very good job in FY18. But as we look forward, um, you'll see that there is a, a slight revenue drop in uh, FY19. This is because a number of uh, the projects that we'd planned for 19 actually were brought forward uh, into 18. But also, uh, there is continuing price pressure uh, in China as we see um, prices going down in the Chinese market that we have to counter with uh, cost reduction uh, ourselves. But we recover that in um, 2021, and I'll show you how we're going to do that uh, with this bridge. So looking at, at the bridge, you'll see there uh, between uh, 2018 uh, and uh, 2019, we do see the revenue drop. Uh, this is because of the slowdown, uh, slight slowdown in the uh, China market, uh, downward pressure on price, in the China market, but also some FX changes uh, in there. But we recover that in uh, 
uh, FY 2021 through forecast increase in our uh, modernization, our maintenance business, and also growth in new markets in the Asia and Middle Eastern areas. Uh, from a profitability point of view, um, we're very focused on cost reduction. Um, I think cost reduction has, has got an important part to play, but also the mix as we move uh, increasingly towards the more profitable service side away from uh, reliance on uh, new installations. Let's look at our strategy. Um, Lumada is a, is a core point uh, of our strategy. It really connects what we do in our factories and what we do in the field. So we're collecting a lot of information from our connected um, elevators and escalators up in the field, analyzing that information to then be able to, to, be able to uh, provide optimized services for our customers and optimization for our own uh, manufacturing processes. But maybe to explain that a little bit better, we're building a global control center. So the global control center will be receiving uh, data back from all of our connected assets um, of elevators uh, and escalators. <clears throat> we can use that data to be able to work with our customers to be able to optimize um, their buildings, but also to be able to provide them new services, such as what is the, uh, what is the number of people in each floor, so we can then regulate the energy, so we can change the energy mix, we can change the lighting, uh, we can, uh, through cameras, we can see how many people are waiting for an elevator, we can target the elevator from its normal uh, pattern to actually target those people to move those people in a more efficient way. So there are lots of services um, that we believe that we can uh, provide our customers through this connected service and through this global um, uh, control center. And this will, I believe, uh, give us new revenue streams, but also ensure that we retain longer-term maintenance contracts with our customers. Um, let's talk about regionally now. Uh, Japan uh, remains the technology center for our business. So this is really where we're investing uh, heavily in our, our R&D. Um, Japan's a, a mature market. So uh, from a new installation uh, point of view, the, uh, the volumes are, are relatively small compared to China, but we do have a growing modernization business, and we also have a growing business for advanced connected building systems um, with smart city uh, and with uh, other high quality uh, developments here uh, in Japan. China is huge. China's really important to us. Uh, it's it's the, uh, the fastest growing market in the world. It's a big market uh, for us to be playing in. But I think, importantly, China will increasingly become our manufacturing hub. So we are changing our strategy to look at growth in Asia and the Middle East, but using our Chinese product platform, using our Chinese supply chain, and really uh, driving lower costs, maintaining quality, but driving volume into our Chinese factories, which we can then put into uh, the growing market of Southeast Asia. So I think um, this, is a, this is a pretty exciting strategy uh, to capture that uh, further volume as we go forward. Now, let's now move to the railway um, side. So uh, could I uh, introduce CEO uh, Andrew Barr uh, and CFO uh, Luca De Kila? So, uh, Andrew, I've worked with for the last uh, 15 years in uh, Hitachi Rail. For the last three years, uh, he has been the CEO of Ansaldo SDS and did a really fantastic job. Uh, and uh, Luca joined the business from Ansaldo a few years ago, was uh, promoted to CFO of the 
uh, rail systems business unit two years ago and has done a fantastic job. Um, and again, they will be delighted to help me answer your questions um, at the end of my presentation. So let's just talk about rail. Um, from a line of business product mix, um, we have uh, over 50% of our businesses with rolling stock, but once again, we have a growing service and maintenance. Um, we have, as we've grown the business over the last five years, we have many, many more assets uh, in service. For example, the Intercity Express project in the United Kingdom, those trains, over half of those trains are now in service. They're now switched on to the service and maintenance um, revenue, and that will last for another 27 and a half years. So over the next midterm plan, we will see our service and maintenance volumes uh, continue to grow. Um, from a geographic point of view, uh, Japan APAC is around 27%. The, the majority of our business remains in Europe, and I'll come on to that a little bit more. And just under 10% is in, in North America. Um, North America is an interesting growth opportunity for us. And again, I'll, I will talk about that uh, a little bit later. So key achievements. 9.6% um, uh, organic growth uh, between FY17 uh, and 18, and record levels of uh, profitability. What I am particularly uh, pleased about, though, is whilst we have been growing the business, uh, we've been improving the profitability, we've also been attracting a lot of very high quality orders. So we've achieved a book to bill ratio of around 1.16 uh, in. FY18, which was much better um, than what we thought we would be able to achieve. Um, towards FY2021, we focus more on digital investment uh, and IoT and solutions. And now that we have acquired 100% of Ansaldo SDS, we will focus on a greater integration of Ansaldo SDS into the core uh, rail team. We've delivered lots and lots of uh, projects during FY18 um, from the, uh, the very beautiful uh, Cebu Limited Express, uh, which I think is a really inspirational uh, design here in Japan, through to um, we showing here is uh, Auto Hall in Australia, which is the world's first driverless heavy haul um, railway system in the world. Uh, which is train sets which are 2.5 kilometers long driving uh, without drivers. It's a, it's a really fantastic achievement, and one that I know Rio Tinto are very, very pleased with. Um, lots of deliveries. I mentioned earlier lots of <coughs> new orders. Um, can I draw your attention to the, uh, you know, the mix on the new orders? You can see here quite a, a significant amount of new orders in the service and maintenance uh, area. Um, this is uh, in Riyadh where we secured a very long-term contract for service and maintenance of the new uh, Rio, um, Riyadh Metro. Um, other areas, significant order in Taiwan uh, for new rail cars. And I think in Italy, we've really cemented ourselves as the number one player. So we've won a number of significant rolling stock and signaling deals um, in FY18, which really sets us up for uh, a very busy factory over the next few years uh, in Italy as we deliver those projects. Sorry. Um, look at the, let's look at the numbers. Um, revenue is slightly down on our plan, but don't forget revenue still grew year on year by... 9.6%. Uh, we did set a very ambitious plan um, in the Rail BU uh, last year. Um, the reason that the revenue uh, is down slightly is because a couple of projects uh, that we were working on were delayed for reasons beyond our control. So those projects uh, aren't lost. But I am very pleased with the increase in profitability. Um, can I just also point out uh, from an EBIT and free cash flow point of view, the reason those numbers are quite high 
is because we disposed of part of our equity stake in one of our special purpose companies. Uh, that's not really our core business. So over the next uh, few years, uh, when market conditions are favorable, uh, then we will sell down uh, some of that uh, equity and recycle that back into um, M&A because part of that, uh, the proceeds from that sale are helping us fund uh, the acquisition uh, of Ansaldo SDS. Um, looking forward uh, over the next three years, uh, in FY19 we see revenues go down very slightly. Uh, this is because um, the Intercity Express project that I mentioned earlier, the manufacturing part of that program will start to uh, reduce. So we do see those revenues come down slightly. Um, however, in FY 2021, uh, we've improved. And we're, once again, similar to the building uh, systems business, we're focused on delivering strong profitability. So cost reduction and the implementation of uh, Lumada will see us uh, grow to 9.5% adjusted operating profit in FY 2021. <clears throat> this is how we're going to do it. Uh, so this is the bridge. Um, as I mentioned before, partial completion of uh, UK projects, see our revenue comes down slightly. Um, but that is... Um, that is recovered as we go towards FY 2021 with uh, a number of projects we've, we've already won uh, going into production in terms of Shinkansen in, uh, in, in Japan, uh, Taiwan, and uh, in Italy, and growth in uh, Middle East and gains in North America. Uh, from a profitability point of view, um, one thing I didn't mention is obviously we have goodwill payment as part of the Ansaldo STS uh, acquisition. Um, this year that depressed our adjusted operating profit by 1.2%. Um, but over time that will be, um, that goodwill will, will, be, uh, will flow through the numbers um, and reduce over time. So you can see um, this is in the signaling and, and turnkey bracket there, uh, the reduced PPA charge um, and further efficiencies in the business will drive us up to uh, 9.5. Um, we are making uh, considerable investments in FY19. We're investing in our, our product platforms. So uh, we've been bringing together uh, common systems, modularity, so that we've got standard platforms. Um, to reduce design costs and make us more competitive. That investment um, is going on. Um, in terms of uh, IoT, we continue to invest in predictive maintenance. So that is now deployed in the United Kingdom uh, and in Italy, where we are collecting a huge amount of data from all our trains and service. And that is helping us um, reduce our labor cost and be able to predict uh, when maintenance interventions are required, thereby further reducing cost. And on the signaling side, <coughs> um, we are investing in digital signaling, uh, both in Japan uh, and globally, to ensure that we're at the head of the race in terms of digital signaling as that requirement grows. Um, so geographically, Japan is still very important for us as an innovation centre. Um, and it's very important that we remain a strong player uh, in Japan. Uh, in Europe, <coughs> excuse me, in Europe where we have the most um, resources uh, and the biggest volume uh, of business, we have a very strong order book. Um, and I think we're very well placed uh, in Europe to continue our uh, expansion there. And then North America, we have um, a presence in North America with two rolling stock factories um, and a, a manufacturing site for signaling equipment. We have an engineering center in Pittsburgh, um, but we really see this as a great opportunity for growth. So we're bidding at the moment on the east coast of the states, 
on the west coast of the states, very, very sizable uh, opportunities, uh, and in Canada uh, in a number of PPP type uh, transactions. So a big push in the United States, uh, which I believe will um, put us into uh, a very strong position there. Um, finally, just talking about digital, um, there's a number of digital streams that we are following uh, in rail. One is really how we add value to our core products. So a dynamic headway is, is a, a technology that we're using to dynamically change the timetable by uh, utilizing data of how many passengers are waiting uh, at platforms, which can be done on a driverless metro. Um, that gives us a competitive advantage when we are looking to uh, compete in a driverless metro environment because clearly our metro can be uh, more efficient. Um, we see new revenue streams. So we, we are actively bidding in Europe at the moment on two opportunities for digital signaling. Uh, this is uh, the next generation in terms of what's known as be in, be out technology. So people are charged for the usage that they have without having to buy a ticket. Um, again, using Hitachi core systems and working with a number of partners uh, in Europe to be competitive in that area. And again, looking at, at different potential um, business models of how that would work. And then operational efficiency, um, we're investing a lot in utilizing Lumada to analyze our manufacturing um, processes and also the control of our supply chain and quality. Then how we feed back real life service information, how do we get that back into our uh, designs very, very quickly so that we can modify and further optimize uh, again. So pretty exciting um, range of opportunities there for us in the digital field. Um, so just to sum up, um, I think the businesses are strong. I think the performance in FY18 uh, was good and solid. FY19, we see the revenues come down slightly, but we're focused on profitability. So we will drive profitability up uh, into 2021 and recover, more than recover uh, the revenues compared to FY18. Um, we're investing in digital, we're investing in uh, cost reduction, and we're always on the outlook for uh, potential M&A opportunities so that I can hopefully convince Higashi Harasan that mobility is um, come to him with a great deal for mobility so we can expand mobility uh, further. Um, so finally, just a, a final look, a reminder of the numbers. Um, so we see um, the profitability going from 8.1 to 9.8% um, uh, in terms of uh, adjusted operating income. Um, EBIT from 10.9 to 11.2, but there is um, some capital investment, as I mentioned before, in uh, FY19, and from a ROIC point of view, um, around 13%. Thank you very much. Now we would like to take questions. In addition to Mr. Dormer, Mr. Seki, Mr. Harada, Mr. Barr, and Mr. Dekila will be taking your questions. Any questions? Presentation. Naoki Osaka of Toyo Keizai Magazine. I have just one question. Uh, after the finish of IEP manufacturing, uh, what kind of rolling stock will uh, Newton Equilif will make? The, would you please show me the name of a project or name of a rail company? Okay. <clears throat> uh, well, we're we're uh, bidding very strongly at the moment for uh, East Midlands trains, for West Coast partnership, and uh, on... I can't remember the day of the week. When do we submit HS2? Uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow. So tomorrow we'll be submitting the, uh, the bid for uh, HS2. Um, but let me just add another point to that. Um, 
we've, we've spent a lot of time over the last two years looking at our design and manufacturing processes for international projects from Japan, but also uh, in Italy and in the UK. So we move production of uh, two contracts uh, from the UK to Italy, and we manufactured those in Italy over the last couple of years. We now have the ability to flex our production between our manufacturing sites. Clearly, um, where it's economic to do so, uh, because it doesn't make sense to build Japanese trains in the United Kingdom, um, but one of the key areas for efficiency in rolling stock production is to make sure that your factory loading is appropriate so that you can absorb all of your fixed costs. Um, so we will be looking at further optimization of the balance of production between our, our manufacturing plants as we go forward. Thank you very much. Any other questions? question. I have two points I would like to ask about. Question number one, with respect to the service uh, business. Uh, on the railway business uh, side, according to your presentation, 11% in terms of amount, uh, 60 billion yen or so. So your service business is growing to that scale. Uh, going uh, forward, uh, after sales uh, market from IEP projects uh, will increase. So growth is expected, I'm sure. Uh, in the current uh, MTMP, either in percentage points or amount, if you could uh, share with us uh, to what extent uh, the service uh, business uh, will grow to. And uh, with respect to the building system BU, the China market, unlike uh, the market in Japan, uh, NI a business is profitable, but after sales uh, market is uh, uh, difficult because it's less profitable compared to the Japanese market. As you look to grow the after sales uh, market, uh, do you see changes happening in China? Even in the China after sales uh, market, do you believe that you can still be profitable? So, how is the service uh, market evolving in China? Okay, um, the the service business, as you rightly say, is eleven percent at the moment. Will move to around about. Let me just check with Luca. Eighteen percent. Eighteen percent in FY twenty twenty one. So, that's quite a step change uh, in terms of our, our service volumes um, in China. Um, you're right, the, uh, there is a lot of competition uh, in the maintenance and service um, field. We are just starting to roll out the connectivity of our uh, escalators and elevators in China. I think um, as we connect all of those uh, elevators and we receive the information uh, back in terms of the performance of the elevators, uh, we are working uh, with the Chinese authorities to understand that you don't necessarily need to have a human being to check an elevator uh, on a very regular basis, which is the case at the moment in China. But by building up that volume of data, I believe that we can have a very credible case where we can convince the authorities that you don't need to inspect quite so frequently and we can use digital and remote services to uh, monitor, but also to uh, reduce the number of maintenance uh, interventions that are required. That means we can capture a bigger volume of the installed base that we've currently got and compete aggressively against third-party maintenance providers. My second question has to do with uh, your railway business. As far as global competition goes, once again, if I could hear your views on global competition, Alstrom and Siemens, they're no longer together. Uh, and with uh, China-US uh, trade friction issue, 
CRC is no longer perhaps uh, being aggressive. I'm sure a lot of changes are happening recently. So on a global basis, in the railway uh, market, uh, what is the competitive landscape? Uh, what is your take? And uh, regionally speaking, North America is uh, one of the markets of your focus. You said, as you know, North America, more or less, uh, railway manufacturers have had a hard time being profitable. So as the competitive landscape uh, changes worldwide, do you think that you can secure enough profit in North America, uh, given the competition and given the business environment in North America? Do you th think that you can still run a viable and profitable business? Yeah, it's a very good question. <clears throat> uh, thank you for that. Um, you're right, the competitive landscape is changing. Um, Siemens and Alstom uh, were working very hard to combine their businesses. Um, that's not been successful, so that's been rejected by the Competition Commission. So we need to see what will be their next steps. Um, I think Bombardier are, have got a very, very aggressive turnaround uh, that they have to do for their business. So we watch to see very carefully uh, whether that turnaround uh, is going to be uh, possible, because it's pretty challenging what they're trying to do. Um, you're right, in North America, um, the Chinese manufacturers have been very aggressive over the last three years or so, and have been successful in, uh, in Boston, successful in Chicago, and successful in uh, Los Angeles. But we are seeing a reaction to that. There is a backlash against that, uh, there is also uh, the political situation between China and uh, the U.S. is not helping that. Um, so I think that's a great opportunity for us. Um, you're right, some of the other uh, rail car manufacturers have not had a, a great time uh, in North America. Um, our experience so far of building trains in, in Miami uh, for Miami uh, and building trains for Honolulu has been fine. Um, I think what we have is we have global processes um, that we use. Uh, we qualify for Buy America. Uh, and using the processes that we use across Europe and across Japan to manufacture in uh, North America, we can be very, very competitive. So I'm, I'm personally, I think it's a good market, and I think it's a market that uh, we we should grow in, in the future. Additionally, just uh, one more question. In North America, setting up a major manufacturing base or acquiring a manufacturing site there, do you have any plans for that? Any ideas for that? Of course we have plans. Um, we have two, two, at the moment, we have two manufacturing sites, um, one in um, in Florida and one in California. Um, depending on the volume of, of orders that we receive, uh, we will look to see what is the right strategy. Do we consolidate into a newer facility? Do we expand those facilities? So that is a piece of work that's, that's going on at the moment. But we have a plan in place for every eventuality depending on um, the volume of orders that we win. Any other questions? Question. ROIC. I have two questions about ROIC. First, page 31. First question is, 2019, 11.6% ROIC is the forecast. Rail and building systems, which has higher number ROIC? If you could let me know. That's my first question. Second question is 13.1% is the target ROIC for 2021. Revenue stretch target has been shown. Even with stretch target being achieved, is it still 13.1% or is it going to be lower than 
0.1% when this stretch target is achieved. <clears throat> Let me answer the first question and then I'll pass the second question to Harada-san, uh, if you don't mind. Um, the, the ROIC for rail and for building systems is broadly the same. Um, whilst there's a slight difference in profitability, there's a slight difference in the geographies in which we operate, so therefore uh, the WAC that we use is slightly different uh, by geography. Um, Harada-san, could you uh, provide a, an answer to the stretch target impact on ROIC? Right now, this stretch target, we're working on this. M&A transactions. We still do not have any concrete direction. Well, we do have internal number, but we haven't estimated that to be announced externally. So ROIC level for 2021, how big a change is there going to be as a result of this? I cannot answer that question at this point in time. Thank you. Any other questions? from Macquarie. Um, just on the North American market opportunity that you, you talk about, could you characterize um, how large you think it is? Um, what maybe, you know, obviously in Miami is, is a metro business, is a, is a metro contract. Is that where you see Hitachi going? Uh, of course, there's been a lot of talk about high-speed rail in the United States is not taking off. So, you know, is it something that you think will, will change? And the last thing on that is that uh, the nature of the projects, do you, do you see you know, PPP work being uh, a key driver of, 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 of uh, increased um, investment in rail? Uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, well, let me talk about the, I think it's public information, the tenders that are out there at the moment. So there's uh, a very important tender uh, in uh, San Francisco for Bay Area Rapid Transit, which is signaling and control. Um, we are strong in uh, signaling control uh, in North America uh, through Ansaldo SDS. Uh, we've uh, recently completed PTC in Boston, um, and we're seeking to build on that. Uh, from a rail car point of view, you know, the, the biggest metro in, in North America is in New York, uh, but New York is fairly saturated with, uh, with our competitors, including Kawasaki, uh, very present in the, uh, the New York area. Uh, there is a big opportunity in Washington. Um, so we're looking very closely at, at Washington. Uh, I think Washington is the second biggest metro uh, with a very large fleet uh, of rail cars. So that's, uh, that's from a rail car point of view um, that's on the radar at the moment. In terms of PPP, um, I think Canada is a very uh, mature uh, PPP market. There are a number of opportunities coming up in um, Ontario. Uh, Hitachi is, uh, with our experience of the Intercity Express project, we have a, a very strong experience of PPP. We know how it works, we know what the risks are, and we know how to manage the risks. Uh, and based on the fact that Hitachi is a very financially strong company, uh, and we have great relationships with uh, Japanese banks uh, and uh, JBIC, etc. I think uh, we are a very credible player in the PPP market. Uh, thank you. Uh, just one second, a second question for me. Um, would you see Bombardier as a partner or as a, as a competitor in the North American market? Um, I would probably see them uh, as a competitor in the North American market. Um, we. Sometimes we partner with our competitors and sometimes we compete. Uh, that is the nature of uh, the business. Um, if we believe that there is a, um, a competitive advantage to be had by partnering up 
with any of the players, then we would seek to do that. Um, if we don't believe that there's a competitive advantage in doing that, then we will, we will compete on our own. All right, thank you. It is time we would like to bring to a close this uh, mobility sector uh, presentation session. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>